the gap, standing for Jesus. Standing in the gap for family and friends. Standing in the gap, one love for all, so we all can make it in. Standing in the gap, standing for Jesus. Standing in the gap for family and friends. Standing in the gap. One love for all, so we all can make it in. Studying to show ourselves approved. Rightly find the word of truth. Increasing our faith to envision our freedom, so we all can glorify our God. Standing in the gap. Standing for Jesus, standing in the gap for family and friends, standing in the gap, one love for all, so we all can make it in, make it in. Wanna hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Wanna hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Wanna hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Wanna hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say, Wanna hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord. Wanna hear him say, good and good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord. Of the Lord, joy of the Lord. Of the Lord, joy of the Lord. Of the Lord. Standing in the Gap USA. This is our Christian education program where we delve into some of the more serious and controversial issues in Christianity. And um, we call it Standing in the Gap because there's a gap between God and his people that is widening. And the world is pulling his people away from him. And he's asking for those who are willing, those who are strong enough, those who have enough faith to stand in the gap. And, and when in the gap, stand on the word of, of, of Jesus, of the Lord, and bring his people back to him. So that's what we do. And I, I just want to welcome you here because we have a great study that we're in the middle of. And we call it um, God's Not Dead in the Case for Christ. And as we get into this, into our, I think it's the eighth our installment, our eighth or ninth. Before we do that, of course, we always want to say a prayer. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you, Father, for bringing us safely again, Father. And Father, if we ever need you, we need you now. The world seems to be pulling away from, from you and from your word even stronger and stronger each week, Father. Father, there's no, no uh, desire on the part of, 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 of the people, Father, to look after those who, who uh, don't have as much to uh, protect this world that you have given us, Father. And some seem to be intent on destroying it. So, Father, we just ask that in these times you strengthen us, Father, and and open our hearts, open our minds to, to, to your word so that we can understand how you want us to live. And Father, we will be there standing in the gap when we're asking you to touch each and every person who found their way here, touch each and every person who will uh, look at this broadcast at a later time, Father, and give them the words 
the encouragement and the development of their faith that they need at this time. So, Father, welcome. We want you to welcome those who who are listening right now, who've taken time out of their day to be here. And may the words that we give, Father, the, the videos that we play, the analysis that we give be acceptable in your sight. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, we've got a we've got a, a study today that I call maybe the craziest one we've ever had. Um, and you'll see, you'll see, you'll you know what I mean as we get into it. But as always, before we jump into it, let me uh, introduce the person that actually makes this run, and that's my wife, Marvel. That's why we're able to give you this broadcast. That's why we're able to do the things we do. So, Marvel, do you have anything to say? Good morning. Good morning, Saints. I'm so glad to be here today. We took a week off and uh, went on a little jaunt, uh, but we're glad to be back today. You can look in the chat box, the chat stream, whatever, and uh, you will see a link to join me in the Facebook room. I'm in the room. You can come in the room. We'll be able to see you. You'll be able to see us. We'll be able to hear you. So please click that link and come into our Facebook room. Also, there's a link to the outline. So you can be able to catch up on the outline. The outline has a lot of information that Art is going to cover in the lesson. And I'm looking forward to this crazy lesson. I'll see y'all later. All right. As I said, <clears throat> excuse me, this, uh, the theme of this study that we've been doing for about eight weeks is God is not dead. And we, um, we started out by looking at creation. Why look at creation? Well, the Bible says that you know God is real by creation. So we looked at creation and we, we uh, put out the proof that is out there that God is alive. Because some people think God is dead or never lived uh, or, or, or never existed or just not relevant in their life. But one thing they, they, they need to keep in mind as we, try, as we prove this, and we prove it in a different way too because we prove the case for Christ because 1 John uh, uh, chapter, uh, uh, John first chapter, uh, indicates that uh, in the beginning was uh, the Word, the Word was God, the Word uh, became flesh and dwelt among us. So uh, the flesh it became is Jesus dwelt among us. But it says that the, flesh, that the flesh was the Word and the Word was God and the Word was with God. And if that's the case, if we prove Jesus, we prove what he uh, 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 is true what he claimed to be, then we've proven in a different way that God is not dead. And just to get us started, I'd like everybody to understand. God's not dead, he's surely alive. And as I indicated, we also, well, we're into the point of uh, the case for Christ, as uh, a lot of you know, I am an attorney, and I'm able to present evidence in court. And, you know, in the courtroom is where we decide the most important issues that face us today. Where someone goes to jail, whether someone needs to recover money from someone who has harmed them, or just to declare certain things, like maybe a subpoena from the Congress is something that, that, that we should <laughs> acknowledge. All everything, but in in presenting the case of court, you got to put evidence on. You got to put evidence on. So what we've done, as I open my my case here, I uh, pull out a file, and I call that file Alpha and Omega file. And what we've been doing down through the weeks is we have, um, as you see, eyewitness evidence. We went through the eyewitnesses: Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul. All the eyewitnesses that you find in the first books of the New Testament. We also uh, tested that evidence to find out could it could does that stand up? Would it stand up in a court of law? Found that it did. We looked at the documentary evidence, which is that Bible you have on your 
on your uh, table or up in your closet or wherever you have it, on your phone or iPad or whatever. That's a documentary. I don't want to see if that evidence, that documentary evidence is the same over over the years. Has it changed? Has legend creeped in or, or, or false uh, statements uh, slipped in there and we find out that it's the same? It hasn't changed. The um, the what they what they believed back after right after Jesus died is the same thing that we believe today has not changed. We also looked at the uh, corroborating evidence, meaning the evidence outside of the Bible, but that's not associated with Christians or whatever, it was associated with Jews and Romans and all that, and found there is evidence outside the Bible that Jesus existed. We even looked at the scientific evidence which was the archaeology, and that was the last time we met with our uh, archaeology, and found out that as they dig into the ground and archaeology became a science, a discipline, that it has confirmed a lot of the things that are in the Bible, things that it, that it can confirm, and has reversed some, um, some thought that people had about history as it showed that what the Bible had written is reliable. Whether it's a place, whether it's uh, uh, a situation, who was in charge, people's names and all that, have been able to be verified. So, and now as we move on, uh, we're going to change up a little bit from the, uh, from the scenario that we have, or the uh, progression that we have. We're going to jump down to what we call psychological evidence. In the court of law, we, we present all kinds of evidence. And sometimes, like I say, it's scientific and documentary, eyewitnesses. We also put in uh, psychological evidence when necessary. And that's what we're going to talk about today, is psychological evidence. Now, the case for Christ, the psychological evidence, is where we are, where we're going. And that's why I indicated that maybe this is the craziest uh, installment, but... <laughs> We're going to find out because there are some things we need to address. Because as we go through this proof, proof, we don't want to ignore some questions that people might have. And especially questions that should be asked and should be resolved and answered. Because if it's not answered, some people won't won't believe. They'll they'll say, well, I had this question, it's not answered, so I'm not, I'm not going where you want me to go. Okay. Well, there's a question of questions out there that we need to talk about psychological evidence. And the question, you know, people say, well, why look at psychological evidence? In reference to Jesus. Hmm. You see, we can't hide from one possible conclusion as we look at Jesus' life and his teachings. And what is that? He claimed to be God. <laughs> he can't claim to be God. You say, so what? Well, I mean, not only that, he sacrificed his life, man. He advocated loving your enemy. Now, now some of these things, people would say, that's crazy. One, he claimed to be God. And why would he sacrifice his life, you know? And then loving your enemy, that's a, that's a novel concept, you know? But see, most of those things, most of these things like sacrificing your life, advocating loving your enemy, are simply outside the bell curve. But the claim to be God was way off the radar. You can avoid the obvious questions, but eventually you'll have to confront the 500-pound gorilla that's sitting over there in the corner. So we must ask a question, and we have to ask a question. And that question, I'm going to ask Marvel to put a, a video up for you that's, that's going to get us started down this road. Psychological evidence. Who do you say Jesus is? And why did you say he is? I think a lot of us have this idea in our heads that a man named Jesus probably did exist and was a great man, a philosopher, a guru, a spiritual sage, a good guy, or in other words, a great moral teacher. But God? No, I don't think so. But according to C.S. Lewis, this is the one thing we mustn't say because it's nonsense. It doesn't make any sense and it's just not an option. Look at it this way. I recently came across a story about some guy in Russia who was traveling around from village to village, preaching, teaching, and promising a lot of hope. And he had a bit of a cultish following. And then he said, 
Oh, by the way, I'm the son of God. Now, what are the first thoughts to shoot across our minds? It's either A, this guy's completely out of his mind, or B, he's a liar and a con man and he's taking advantage of these people. But I don't think any of us would be thinking C, oh, what a great man and a great moral teacher. Poof. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. Any man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He'd either be a lunatic on the level of a man who thinks he's a poached egg or else the devil of hell. So then for Jesus to go around claiming to be the son of God, there can really only be three options. Either A, he's a madman, B, he's lying, or C, the option that terrifies us. He actually is who he says he is. Now some of us will try to wiggle out of this by saying, yeah, but how do we know he really said those things? Well, either he said them, or somebody else invented that he said them. And if somebody else made them up, then we have to be able to answer all those questions like, who made it up, and when did they make it up, and why, and what could they possibly gain? Well, according to Peter Kreeft, professor, philosopher, and author of over 80 books, here's what they gained. Their friends and family scorned them. The Jews and Romans stole their social standing, possessions, and political privileges. They were imprisoned, whipped, tortured, exiled, crucified, eaten by lions, and cut to death by gladiators. Others of us will say, yeah, but there could be other options. Like, what if he was just misunderstood and didn't really mean those things? Or, what if he was just a legend created around campfires? Well, it's impossible it was all just a big misunderstanding. But look at it this way. Imagine if you were on trial for your life, all because of a huge misunderstanding. Wouldn't you do everything in your power to try to clear it up? Jesus doubled and then tripled down. And the legend thing? Well, people who know about this stuff and common sense tells us that there simply wasn't enough time for a legend this significant to take root and spread. Look at it this way. In order for a legend of this size to grow, at least 100 years or a full generation must pass. Why? Because anyone who's alive who could debunk the legend would have to be dead. Now Jesus died around the year 34, give or take, and the earliest accounts we have of early Christian life were written around the years 50 or 60. So that leaves a window of about 30 years for a legend of this magnitude to take root and spread. So that would be like someone trying to convince me that Joe Schicatelli, a guy I went to high school with, was the son of God and raised some guy from the dead at the prom. And then me and about 300 other people saying, um, no he wasn't and that never happened. Every single one of us probably has a different idea in our head of who Jesus is. Some of us will say he was just invented or misunderstood or a legend. But these are all just illogical speculations with no historical basis. The easy way out is just to say yeah, he was just a good guy and a great moral teacher. But as C.S. Lewis says, we gotta stop with this patronizing nonsense about him being some great human teacher. He didn't leave that option open to us. He didn't intend to. Instead, we're left in a rather uncomfortable spot and we have to make our own choice. Do I mock him? or pity him as just some poor guy who was completely out of his mind? Or do I spit on him as a liar and a fraud who deceived billions of people? Or do I fall down on my knees and say, yes, 
God. Wow. I hope you were listening to that because it it basically was a summary of where we've been whereby we know Jesus existed. We know that Jesus is sayings. We know that uh, there's evidence outside the Bible for his existence. So if he existed, which I believe the case has been made, and he said the things that he said, which is, like I say, way off the radar, some of it, okay? And some of it not even in the bell curve. But if he said those things, then we, there's a question we need to ask. And, and the question is, if he said that and he believed that, then was Jesus, as you see in the, in the uh, graphic, was Jesus insane <laughs> for saying what he said? I mean, it's, it's, it's a question because I'll tell you, if someone came to us today, just like in the video, and was staying, you know how, how these people stand on the corner and they preach and everything and, 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 and hollering and screaming at everybody uh, and about people walking by like they don't seem or whatever. And he makes the, uh, the claim that I am God, I am the son of God, you know, we would say that he's crazy. And I do a little work for the Hamilton County Community Mental Health Board, and insanity and lunacy is real. Is real. People, people are, are out of their minds sometimes, a whole group of people, and they need help. So, if a, if a guy like Jesus came by and was uh, talking about, I am the son of God, and and you need to do this, you need to do that, and all that, there's a good chance that that um, we would label him as being insane. And you might ask, um, well, he claimed to be God, right? Yeah, he did. So how, how do we today define mental illness and see if we can, we can analyze Jesus from how we would uh, react to him and what he was saying. Is he insane or was he insane? Hmm. Well, in in Ohio and across the country, it's, it's uh, basically similar. The law has uh, identified what it means by mental illness. And, it, and the effort is, is to determine what mental illness is and then determine what we should do about it, a person. In Ohio, it's defined as a substantial disorder of thought or of mood, perception, or orientation, uh, or memory that grossly impairs uh, judgment, behavior, capacity to recognize reality, and the ability to meet the ordinary demands of life. So when we look at that, it says a substantial disorder of thought or mood, perception, or orientation. Let's look at that. So we go to the next. Uh, what are disorders of thought? Delusions. What are delusions? Delusions are fixed false beliefs. Then uh, paranoia a lot of times is, is deemed a delusion. Paranoid delusion. Where somebody believes something but there's no, no evidence of it, no rational reason why it should be, it should be believed, but they, they believe it are uh, grandiose delusions where, as somebody like Jesus would say, I'm God. That's called gr grandiose. And a lot of people say, I'm, I'm Obama or I'm a fa uh, Obama's father or I'm, I'm a Trump's daddy or I'm Trump, you know. <laughs> or I'm JFK's cousin. <laughs> JFK's cousin and all that. And it's, it's something they say about themselves that is just not believable and there's no evidence of it or whatever. And so, and somatic delusions are, are things that you think about yourself. And for one would be that somebody thinks they're too fat, you know, or too skinny or whatever. And, you know, they say, well, that's normal. Yeah, but some people, they're, they're skinny and think they're fat. 
or they're fat and think they're skinny. That's where the um, eating disorders come in. Exactly. So, so that those things, your paranoia, your grandiosity, and your somatic delusions could lead you to be determined to be insane. But it, it takes more than that. And then you're talking about other things like looseness of association. That's when a person can't, can't keep two thoughts together. You talk to them and they're all over the place, making no sense, no stream of consciousness, and that's the flight of ideas also. Well, one idea, then another idea, and you say, what are you talking about? Or disorganized. Their, their, their thoughts are just so disorganized that, that you can't make any sense of it, they can't make any sense of it, and they're just way out there. So those are disorders of thought. And we're going to see how these fit on Jesus in a minute. Or mood. Let me tell you what's your mood. Well, mania. A lot of people know what mania is. I'm like maniac, you know. People are just so hyper and all that. They're going at 100 miles an hour when they should be going at 20. And um, Or depression. That's the other side of bipolar. One is mania, the other is depression. Um, where they are so depressed that they can't do anything. Some people get so depressed... They can't even get out of bed. They can't clean the house, take care of the kids, or anything. Lability of, of mood. What that is is that one one moment a person's uh, laughing, next next moment they're crying and just transitioning back and forth and all that kind of thing. They can't keep that under control. Affect is when when uh, a person is is uh, laughing for no reason. <laughs> you say. Why are you laughing? Why are you crying? You know, no reason to be crying. Your affect doesn't fit the situation. Is affect also when you laugh at a sad situation or you cry at a joyous situation? Absolutely, absolutely. And the, and and like I said, these things are evidence of of mental illness or, or insanity. May may not be though. I mean, it it. It is evidence of it, but it may not be anything that, that we need to do about it. Then you have disorders perception. That's where people have visual hallucinations. They see things that aren't there, or auditory hallucinations, where they're talking to someone who's not there, and or listening to somebody who's not there, and it's controlling them. Hmm. Those are the things that get you uh, labeled as insane. Then you have your disorders of orientation, which is, you don't you have no recognition of time, date, or place. You ask them where they're, what the date is, and they'll say it's 1901, you know. Or you ask them what time it is, and they, they can't tell you. And they, they they don't know where they're at. A lot of times they get into the hospital and they're being examined, and they say, do you know where you're at? Yeah, hey, I'm at home. Well, no, you're not. <laughs> uh, so those, those are the kind of things. In Ohio law, and like I say, uh, laws across the country are uh, similar that will get you labeled as mentally ill. Now, you know something else, honey? Um, a lot of these, I'm going to call them characteristics, uh, disorientation or uh, some of these other hallucinations and things, some of those are not mental illness. They may be caused by medication or they may be caused by you just were playing soccer or football and you got a concussion and that sort of thing too. So it's not, I mean, these things that we're talking about could be something other than mental illness also. Isn't that correct? Not really. And the reason I say that is that the way um, the law looks at it, they don't care how it started. Okay. <laughs> They're looking at where you're at right now. <laughs> okay. 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 Whether you, you, you've you been uh, uh, drinking too much alcohol and it's frying your brain or your drugs you're taking from, you got hit in an automobile accident, now you just ain't right anymore or whatever. They're not looking at the uh, how it started. They're saying, how are you able to deal with life right now okay. with with your situation? Now, some things, to um, to back up some of what you're saying, some things are just episodic. That means that I got in the car, I hit my head, and for an hour or two, I'm, I'm nutty as a fruitcake. But then I got better, and I don't even know why I was saying all that stuff. 
but I ain't saying it now, so don't take me to the hospital. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. So that's... All right, so the episodic part of it is, I guess, what I was referring to. Yeah. But during that time when you're in that state, you're, quote, unquote, mentally ill. Exactly. Okay. You're mentally ill, and the question is, what, 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 what do we need to do about it, you know? And, and, and that's the next question with mental illness, because even the law will go on uh, and I'm sorry, memory. I, I I messed up. Okay. The the last one is memory, and that's where your dementia and all that. People don't have any memory. They can't remember from one moment to the next. They can't function in life that way. You know, uh, some people get in cars and drive, and they they can't find their way home or whatever, or they can't remember to take their medicine. They can't remember what uh, uh they they go for a walk out into the neighborhood, and they can't remember how to get home and all that. Somebody find them dead in a field somewhere and all that. Disorders of memory can be mentally, can be mental illness also. Now, the Ohio Code goes on and says, okay, a mentally ill person who is not a danger to themselves or to others, you can't lock them up. They're not doing anything. Yeah, they're nuts. They're, um, they're out of their mind. But what we want, we don't want to take away someone's rights because <coughs> unless they represent a substantial risk of physical harm to themselves, manifested by evidence of threats or attempts at suicide or serious self-inflicted harm. That's, that's one category. With the mental illness and then you're doing these things, that will get you in a mental hospital. Also, do you represent a substantial risk of physical harm to others manifested by evidence of recent homicidal or violent behavior? Evidence of recent threats that place another in reasonable fear of violent behavior. So any any uh, uh, homicidal, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna kill somebody or uh, or I'm gonna beat them up and I'm gonna break in their house. I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. Evidence of of, of, of threats and all that kind of thing in conjunction with your mental illness get you into a hospital. Are you a substantial and immediate risk of serious physical impairment or injury to yourself in that you can't provide for your basic physical needs anymore? What you see a lot of times with the mentally ill is people just walking out on the street, doesn't look like they've changed their clothes in about three months. All their clothes are raggedy or whatever. Or it's, 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 it's hot, 90 degrees outside, they got five or six layers of clothes on and all that. You go into the house, it's all messed up and uh, rat infested and bug infested and there's no food in the refrigerator and all that kind of thing are they supposed to are diabetic and haven't taken their medicine for three or four months and all that they can't take care of themselves because of their mental illness that's a category that can get them locked up also and then there are those that could benefit from treatment for their mental illness and that they're in need of that by evidence that creates an imminent risk to the substantial rights of others or, or, or the person. For instance, we have some people who uh, are so paranoid uh, that they, uh, they, they're always calling for help. They call 911 all the time. Then you do that about five or six times, the police will show up and they will take you to the hospital. <laughs> there's, nothing, there's nothing going on. People call and they'll say, people are breaking into my house. And you say, well, how are they breaking? They're coming through the wall. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that, that kind of thing. And, and, and the, it affects others' rights because sometimes they'll go and um, uh, down the street and knock on somebody's house and say, this is my house, mm-hmm. you know. Or they'll, this is my car and things like that. that. That interferes with other people's rights and all that. You do that, they, along with your mental illness, they will lock you up. They'll lock you up. Now, um, it can be criminal. They can be criminal. Let's say we we have a lot of people incompetent to even stand trial. They commit crime, but they're so so mentally ill, whatever. You can't hold them responsible for because they have no idea what they're doing. They're mentally ill, and they're incompetent to stand trial. The charges get dismissed, but they get locked up in a mental institution, or they're not guilty of their crime because of insanity. So they're competent, but at the time they uh, committed that act, they were not in control of their mind. And then that's the criminal part, but civil commitment 
is uh, different, whereby uh, we have to um, we have to put you in the hospital and we have to treat you against your will. Meaning, you won't get treatment. You won't you won't agree to treatment. But we know you need treatment, and we can't let you go and all that. So we keep you in the hospital, and we can commit uh, involuntarily commit you for long periods of time to try to get you better. Now that's a quick uh, analysis of uh, mental illness, how we deal with it today and all that. Uh, well, how we understand it today. The next part of it is, what is the treatment for it? Well, you, you, have to, uh, you have to get some counseling or, or something, you know. <laughs> uh, I like that slide. <laughs> the doctor is in. But the way we do it, you know how they treat mental illness more so than anything else? Some people say, well, it's counseling and all that kind of thing. Uh, and, and counseling is okay for those who are, are tipping into mental illness and all that. But for those who are in it, this is how they treat it. There you go. That's how they treat it. Pills, medicine, all that. And basically, uh, it's medicine for the brain. Um. And there is counseling. I'm not going to say that. Um, you know, sit down, talk to you. Some people, you can talk to them and kind of clear up some things or whatever. But uh, a lot of people have to go into the hospital. They have to get into a hospital uh, and get committed. You know, they go on to a psych ward and can be there for a long time. And then they got outpatient services for those that don't go in the hospital. But you go in the hospital and you get released but you still need to have some treatment. So on an outpatient basis, you're assigned to a mental health agency where you have a psychiatrist, counselor, case manager, all that kind of thing to follow you and make sure that you are, uh, you're on track. So usually <clears throat> um, when, uh, let's say you got committed and then they come into the court where you work and the doctor says, okay, they're okay to get out of the hospital but they need outpatient services. So that's, they probably still are on medication. They still have a, a medical doctor as well as a psychologist or social worker or somebody and the case manager and all that, all of that goes with it. On the outside. So they wrap services around you uh, for treatment uh, that allows you to be outside of a hospital as opposed to inside, which is more of a, a invasive uh, uh, structure. For okay, you. thank you. <clears throat> Keep you away from everybody. And of course, you know, they have group homes. And then some people have to go into nursing homes, especially your dementia and Alzheimer's people, because they can't really get better once you start going down that path. Then they get to the point where nobody can handle them, so they have to go into a nursing home. All right. Now, let's talk a little bit about the path of psychology. Uh, <laughs> Psychology has not always been a disciplined science. <laughs> oh, gosh. I'll let you know. <laughs> and actually, it's traveled the sad path of cruelty and treatment to res a respected field of medicine and science. And as you look at this, they, you know, they, they're they standing over you, preaching to you, because then they're, then they're going inside of you and all that kind of thing. And then you have even, you know, lobotomies and, all that, where they drill holes in your brain, and they didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> it was cruel. It was very cruel, but if you got into that system, they didn't know how to deal with it. That's, that's the bottom mm -hmm. line. It wasn't a science. They had no idea how to do it. They actually thought it was just demons and things like that. And then it got to the point where they just warehoused you into a hospital, whereby once you got in there, you never really got out. And, and once you're labeled as mentally ill, it don't go away. The stigma stays with you uh, the rest of your life. That's uh, prior to it becoming a more disciplined science. Now, uh, some people say, what, what do you mean that it's, uh, it's gotten better? Some, some still feel it's a, prof a profession of quacks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make quacking sounds, and you say the first thing that pops into your mind. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes as I look at some of the cases that come before me when I'm doing this uh, work for the Mental Health Board, 
is sometimes it, it seems that way. <laughs> sometimes they, I don't I don't think they know what they're doing, and so what do they do? They pump you up with chemicals. And then you know uh, we were talking about this one time. They pump you up with chemicals, and they don't even know why the chemicals work. Exactly. And there's still a lot of things they can't even explain. Like, um, mental illness doesn't always come from um, um, chemical imbalance, they say. It can be organic. Like like you said, you got hit in the head, and and or you uh, overdid drugs or whatever, and You've been do, you've been a, a serious alcoholic for twenty or thirty years and all that. The damage is done. They can't reverse it. So <clears throat> scientists are not really sure why the medicine works, as you said. They know it does on some people, or maybe it masks uh, the behavior or whatever. But when they give it to you, a lot of times, if people stay on this medicine, they can go back out and live a relatively normal life, except for side effects, which will stop them from taking the medicine, and it becomes a revolving door. Revolving door. Now, as I do in, in uh, presenting this case for Christ, I always say, you know, there's some things I'm not an expert at, so I give you an expert. We're going to use an a expert this week, as we've done with the other categories. I'm going to present to you an expert. His name is Dr. Gary Collins. He's a Ph.D., master's degree in psychology from the University of Toronto, doctorate in clinical psychology, Purdue University, professor of psychology at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, chairman of the psychology division there, president of the American Association of Christian Counselors. He's a prolific author. He's written uh, 150 articles or journals and other uh, periodicals, editor of Journal of Psychology and Theology, authored 45 books on psychology-related topics, general editor for the classic textbook Christian Counseling, a comprehensive guide, has been studying, teaching, and writing about human behavior for 35 years. Hmm. I present Dr. Collins as an expert in psychology, not only in psychology, but also in psychology and Christian counseling. Psychology and Christian account. Why do we need an expert? Because we're going to find out whether or not Jesus was insane. Really ill. <laughs> he said, I'm God. I'm the son of God. I was there at the beginning of creation. And all that kind of thing. You know, and I, as I thought about it, I said, uh, think, think about this too. Kind of, kind of keep this in your mind too. Jesus and John the Baptist. Okay? <laughs> See how... How, how we would treat either of them if they were around today. But in any event, as always, in any court of law, you have the, uh, you have the uh, uh, prosecutor, you have the defense counsel, or whatever. I call them the antagonist and the protagonist. All right? Our, uh, our uh, expert is the, is the protagonist. Okay? The other side is the antagonist. And that's represented by this guy named Strobel. So what we do is we kind of contrast the antagonist and the protagonist as we would in a court of law because there are two sides. Um, and our, our antagonist will be the one asking the questions that our, that our expert will be answering. And it's Strobel. Strobel, as, you, as, as I say each time, he wrote the book uh, A Case for Christ. And that's, I used a lot of, 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 of that material in creating this study. And he um, he was a, he was an atheist, and he, it was his uh, goal to um, use his uh, uh, investigative skills to debunk everything about Jesus and God and all. He, he, he was an atheist. As he was going through and and investigating all that, he became a believer. <laughs> so, but at the time he was an anti a, a uh, atheist, we're we're using him to ask the question that our expert needs to answer. First question, he says, was Jesus crazy just like those currently locked up in mental institutions who also claim to be either God, Son of God, or Jesus himself? And I can tell you that a lot of those people do claim to be those. I am God. I am uh, Jesus. And I'm Muhammad. I'm all these things. Well, experts say uh, 
Strobel says, experts say that people suffering from delusional psychosis may appear rational much of the time, but can have grandiose beliefs that they are superlative individuals and are even capable of attracting the following. Now, is that what happened with Jesus? Was he a superlative um, individual who had the ability to attract a following? Our expert says no, because psychology looks at thoughts. A person is not merely ill just because they say something that is delusional. We talked about that. Paranoid delusions, grandiose delusions. They say whoever they are, that's fine. It's how they react to that delusion that's important. And, and plus, let's look at it. Jesus was not paranoid. He was acutely aware of the dangers posed by the people around him. I think we can agree to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jesus was able to carry on logical conversations. He wasn't disoriented and uh, all, all that kind of thing. He, he, uh, and there were no flight of ideas. He had, a, he had a stream of consciousness in what he was saying. You might not agree with it. And he didn't, he didn't just go from subject to subject and nobody knew what he was talking about. They might not believe it. And he had no bizarre thoughts or actions. Hmm. So he couldn't go on that. We call him insane. But psychology also looks at their emotions, their moods, which may reveal evidence of mental illness. That's what our expert said. And Jesus never showed inappropriate emotions such as anger, depression, or anxiety. He cried at the death of Lazarus. That was, that was rational. Even his anger was appropriate because it was in response to injustice and blatant mistreatment of people. And Jesus did not exhibit unsuitable behavior. He did not dress oddly. That's why I say keep in mind John the Baptist, okay? He was able to relate socially to others. He was loving. He was not immobilized by compassion. He did not have a bloated ego. <laughs> he stayed with God. <laughs> but he, yeah. he was also very humble. Exactly. And uh, he always knew what he was doing and where he was going. He cared deeply about people, including women and children. Well, and at the time, those were people not highly esteemed, really. Um, he was able to accept people while not merely winking at their sin. Meaning, he called out your sin, but he still accepted you. He responded to individuals based on where they were at and what they uniquely needed. Hmm. So there is no evidence of unsuitable behavior related to what you might say is a mental illness on his part. But anyway, there's no evidence Jesus was suffering from any known mental illness. That's what our experts said. Well, our antagonists say, but what about the persons who directly interacted with Jesus and had a closer vantage point? Some of those people concluded that Jesus was demon-possessed and raving mad. Yeah, they did. You go to John 10, 19, 21. The Jews who heard Jesus say these words were again divided. Many of them said he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Now that, that's, a, that's a question right there. <laughs> no. <laughs> now I've got another video for you that I'm asking Marvel to put up that's going to kind of put some of this into uh, perspective about the people who thought Jesus was mad, out of his mind. Jesus' activities in Galilee have been challenging the customs and traditions expected of a Jewish man in the first century. He's been pushing the boundaries. He even touched people with horrific contagious diseases. And the things he was saying went beyond what any man should claim. He even claimed to forgive sin. His family in Nazareth have been hearing the reports of what Jesus has been up to. And they've been getting more and more concerned. So now they come to get him and take him home. Then Jesus entered the house, and again a crowd gathered. 
so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Jesus' family must have been horrified. And they were probably also listening to what the religious leaders were saying about Jesus, about how the things he was saying were crazy and how his behavior was so scandalous and shocking. So Jesus' family came to take him back to his town in Nazareth, just as you would do to a lost child or relative suffering from a mental illness. I'm sure you'll agree, it's an amazing scene. And imagine how Jesus must have felt. Why does it so often feel like those who are closest to us are those who know us the least? We've all had family troubles at some stage or another. Who do you rely on when no one understands you, not even your own family? Have you learned to rely on your Father in Heaven for your identity and strength? saying. But see, what our expert says is that all these people, the Jews and even his family who thought that, that he had lost his mind or whatever, their beliefs were not a diagnosis of a trained mental health professional. They were reacting to Jesus' claims to be the good shepherd. His assertions were far beyond their understanding of the norm, not because he was mentally unbalanced. And others in the crowd disputed those allegations by saying, that this is not the saying of a man possessed by a demon, because a demon cannot open the eyes of the blind. You see, Jesus did not just claim to be God, he backed up his assertions. By miraculous acts of compassion, such as healing the blind, astounding demonstrations of power over nature, uh, transcendent and unprecedented teachings, divine insights into people, his own resurrection from the dead. See, you can say, you, you, a lot of people say a lot of things, but then they can't back it up. Jesus backed it up. And no one else uh, has ever been able to resurrect themselves. <laughs> I'm dead and I resurrect myself. Nope. And that, that might be evidence that he is what he claimed to be. Now, I said, but what about the words of Charles Templeton? I talked about him before. He was a contemporary of Billy Graham, but lost his faith and became a skeptic. Tupin said many illnesses were psychosomatic and could be cured when the sufferer's perceptions changed. Doctors today use placebos to change the perceptions of their patients and heal them because the patients actually believe the medication can heal them. Our expert says it is true that Jesus could have healed by suggestion. Take the time when Jesus said it was the person's faith that healed him. Yeah. Jesus was insightful enough, though, to know that such an um, uh, that a person had an illness who had an illness or disability, that uh, that person may only have needed some encouragement. However, keep in mind that such an explanation cannot explain all of the healings for which a psychosomatic illness is virtually impossible, such as lifelong blindness. That's not psychosomatic. Leprosy, <laughs> lifelong lameness. Bringing people back from the dead, death is not a psychologically induced state. Psychosomatic healing generally take time, but Jesus' healing were instantaneous. Many times people who are healed psychosomatically have their symptoms return in a few days. However, we don't see any of that with Jesus' healings. When he heals you, you are healed for real. When Jesus, uh, uh, psychology cannot explain the nature miracles of Jesus. Calming the sea and the storm, turning water into wine. Uh, there goes your psychosomatic arguments. Now, um, our antagonist um, says, okay, could Jesus simply have been a hypnotist? The people are pulling things out of the sky. It maybe just hypnotize everybody. Uh, could this have been how Jesus convinced the wedding guests that they were drinking wine? Could hypnotism account for his exorcisms, transfigurations, where John and Peter saw his face glow and his clothes shine white like as light, or any of the healing? Can hypnotism do that? 
See, there, there are stories today, uh, there are stories today where people with skin disorders have been healed psychologically. Isn't it possible that Lazarus was not really dead, but in a death-like trance that had been induced by Jesus' hypnosis? Could not Jesus have effectively conditioned his disciples to hallucinate his appearance in response to certain cues like the breaking of bread? And his inability, and, and what about his inability to perform miracles in his hometown? Could that be because they knew him well and were not in awe of him? Which is precisely the problem that hypnotists run into. <laughs> <clears throat> our expert says, mm -mm. in order to believe that, you must have a lot of faith in hypnosis. He said, hypnosis seems to only work on those who are susceptible to it, i.e. those that want it to work. It does not work on a large number of people such as the 5,000 persons who witnessed the miracle of the feeding from the fish and the bread. It doesn't seem to work on those who are skeptical or who are doubters, such as James's brother and Saul of Tarsus or doubting Thomas, all who first doubted but then became believers. Or there, Strobel. Or Strobel. <laughs> there is no way hypnosis could explain the empty tomb. There is no way Jesus could have hypnotized the Pharisees or the Romans who were doubters and skeptic and who would have gladly produced the body if it was still in the tomb. How could he have hypnotized the guests at the wedding in Cana or the master of the banquet? He only talked to the servants and only told them to pour wine into a large basin. While the gospel gives all kinds of details about Jesus, there's nothing in the gospels to suggest that Jesus was saying or doing anything that would suggest he was hypnotizing people. Let's throw that one out the, out the window right quick. Well, Strobel didn't give up. He comes back and says, okay. People perform exorcism, so was Jesus merely an exorcist? Is it even possible to believe that demons are responsible for certain illnesses and bizarre behaviors? Our expert, in order to fairly answer the question, you must first believe that demons exist. Lots of people believe that angels exist, but more doubt the existence of demons. If demons exist, then it's not a stretch to believe that some are malevolent. The failure to believe in demonic forces makes the unbelieving psychiatrists and psychologists simply pump people full of medicine with, uh, when clearly the medicines have no effect. There are cases that do not respond to normal medicine or psychiatric treatment. That is just true. And yes, there are some cases that respond to psychosomatic treatment and Jesus could have cured people that way. See, that would not explain the story of the demon self-named legion who was exercised from one man and cast into a herd of, of swine. Our expert says psychology today is beginning more and more to accept the supernatural in light of things that science cannot understand. They get to a point where they say, well, it just couldn't be this, so maybe there is something supernatural about this. Many are beginning to recognize that there are more things in heaven and earth than our philosophies can account for. Now, what would be our conclusion under Ohio law if Jesus walked the earth today? Would he fit the criteria that we use today? Did he have a disorder of memory? No, memory seems, his memory seemed to be extraordinary. He talked about seeing things from the beginning of time to the present. Or did he suffer from a disorder of orientation? No, he was aware of date, time, and place. Did he suffer from a disorder of perception? Now, he did claim to see things no one else could see or hear things that no one else could see. Now, in our world, we might consider that a substantial disorder of perception. And, and then we might today. But what about a disorder of mood? He was not overly aggressive or depressed or manic. He did he had righteous anger, indignation. His mood did not change without appropriate cause. He would not be considered manic or clinically depressed. What about a disorder of thought? There does not seem to be evidence of any paranoia. He had no doubt of his mission and goal or how he could get there. And clearly the world would conclude that there is substantial evidence of delusions of grandeur, though. 
Because he said he was God. He claimed to have more knowledge than the trained religious leaders at the time, and his actions were also a serious threat to his own safety. So some people say, well, he must have been mentally ill, based on all that. However, you must also have evidence that these beliefs and hallucinations grossly impaired his judgment. Was his judgment impaired? Hmm. What about his behavior? Was his behavior impaired? What about his ability to recognize reality? Was that impaired? Hmm. Or what about his ability to take care or meet the ordinary demands of life? Some could say his judgment was impaired because he kept acting in ways that threatened his life and that of his father by confronting the religious leaders, causing disruption in the temple, blasphemous statements, traveling in areas that were off limit. The ordinary demands of life as we know them were affected because he had no home. Actually admitted he had no place to lay his head. He had no paying job, owned no property, and had no source of income. Hmm. With Jesus a risk of harm to himself. No. Well, I guess they said maybe it was because he, he allowed himself to be crucified. Hmm. Was Jesus a risk of physical harm to others? Uh, nope. Not, not, not in the way we look at it today. Now, the reason I'm going through this is, is to saying that I'm not. This is not to show that that under our laws today, that Jesus would be declared unconditionally uh, sane. I'm saying that if Jesus came back today, our laws would probably lock him up, put him in a mental institution. And if and if if you think that's a stretch, what do you think they would have done to John the Baptist? living out in the, in the uh, desert, eating locusts and honey and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, uh, the question we have, have to answer is, was Jesus crazy? Was he insane? Was what he doing uh, uh, insane? Mentally ill. I have to, I have to let you uh, answer that question. Jesus was not mentally ill in the way that um, uh, we we uh, determine mental illness uh, today. If you really look at the criteria, it just doesn't meet it. Remember, if somebody says something that's just off the radar or whatever, that doesn't mean they're crazy. That means they may have a different perception of things than you. And so, um, was he crazy? You need to answer that question or because he was either, like like I said in the, in the video, the first video, he was either a liar, a con man, or is he who he said he is? You have to, you have to make that decision. But as for our experts... Our expert concludes that there was no evidence that Jesus was suffering from any mental illness at all. All right. There you go. I don't know if anybody has any questions in the, uh, anybody there? People are here. You all have any questions? Any questions about the descriptions of mental illness or how Jesus... You know, the only thing that I would say is that, so if Jesus decided he wanted to walk around on the earth today and he said the things that he said that are documented in the Bible, but he also did the things he did that are documented in the Bible. So somebody's going to bring him to court and say, he, this man is crazy because he says he's the son of God. And then right before our eyes, he makes a blind person see or he gets lets a lame person get up and walk and it's not a stage thing like some of those pastors on tv that's trying to get a ten dollar donation for something or another then you have to say well oh my goodness he has to be because this is impossible otherwise that's very clear insight on your part because the whole 
the whole basis of this is that I can say all kind of things and you can think I'm crazy for saying them but when I back them up when I back them up then there's no evidence that that's a mental illness obviously and hypnosis and all that kind of thing you know uh, you're going to hypnotize a uh, uh, 100,000 people or, or 10,000 people or well, all of them at the same time? I don't think so. Mm -mm. No, it, that doesn't make sense. See, the arguments against against it don't make sense. And so you're trying to say, well, Jesus didn't make sense. Your arguments make no sense. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can't make you believe that Jesus backed up his statements. I can tell you that if we prove that he did, which we have all this evidence has been pre presented already, then you've got no argument about him being insane. That's what it is. That's the psychological evidence. And next, uh, we're going to, uh, next time we're going to proceed to the identity evidence. And, and I'm, I'm taking these a little out of order uh, for a couple reasons, but I was going to the rebuttal evidence, but that's generally at the end, so it's it's, it's right to move that down. Um, but next, the next uh, outline will be on identity evidence, and this is who did Jesus think he was? Now we can we can say that he said that. What did he really think of himself? And we'll get into that. All right, Marvel, you got anything? No, I'm looking forward to the identity evidence. Identity evidence in the case for Christ. We will be there next week. And I want to thank everybody that uh, joined us. And like we said, if you have any questions or whatever, you can send them to us. Um, and I'll be more than happy to address them. Either, um, I guess, email or whatever. Email. You can put it in the chat box. We monitor that. So uh, after this live goes into Facebook, ether um you can still put comments or questions in there and we will monitor and answer as uh as they come in but you can also email us um and uh or message us facebook message us as well all right well then, then i thank you for showing up i just want you to remember like a lion <laughs> we'll see you next week let's uh let's pray as we always do our father god thank you for the lessons that you're you're giving us especially the one today father and open our hearts and open our minds to the reality father and the rationality father and the fact that jesus is who he claimed to be and if he is who he claimed to be then you are who you claim to be Father, we ask for your protection as we go through this week. This world is crazy. People have crazy beliefs and all that, Father. And we do need protection. But we also need the strength and the faith to stand up to it, Father. So we ask you for that strength and that faith, Father. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap One love for all So we all can make it in Standing in the gap Standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap one love for all, so we all can make it in. Studying to show ourselves approved. Rightly divine the word of truth. Increasing our faith to envision our freedom. So we all can glorify our God. Standing in the 
the gap, standing for Jesus. Standing in the gap for family and friends. Standing in the gap, one love for all, so we all can make it in. Make it in. Want to hear him say good, good and faithful servant Want to hear him say enter to the joy of the Lord Want to hear him say good, good and faithful servant Want to hear him say enter to the joy of the Lord Want to hear him say good, good and faithful servant Want to hear him say enter to the joy of the Lord Want to hear him say good, good and faithful servant Want to hear him say in inner to the joy of the Lord Want to hear him say good, good and faithful servant Want to hear him say in inner to the joy of the Lord Want to hear him say good and good and faithful servant Want to hear him say in inner to the joy of the Lord Joy of the Lord, Lord, joy of the Lord, of the Lord.